All right, it's, it's my um, pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker, my colleague, my friend, State Representative Stephanie Chang. Representative Chang, soon to be State Senator Chang, is serving her second term representing Michigan's sixth House District. Representative Chang is the Minority Vice Chair of the House Committee on Law and Justice and serves on the House Committees on Education Reform and Natural Resources. Much of her legislative work is focused on air quality, affordable and safe drinking water, education and criminal justice reforms. She is the chair of the Progressive Women's Caucus, a founding member of the Asian Pacific American Legislative Caucus, and a member of several other prominent caucuses. She also serves on the federal EPA Local Advisory Committee. Being one of the only state legislators with a district service center, Stephanie focuses much of her work with residents in her district, ranging from saving homes from tax foreclosure to hosting a community baby shower for low-income pregnant women. Before serving in the legislature, she worked as a community organizer in Detroit for nearly a decade. She served as the state director for Next Gen Climate Michigan, the community engagement coordinator for the James and Grace Lee Bog School, the deputy, deputy director for the Campaign for Justice, an organizer for Michigan United, yes, I'm still going, and as an assistant to the infamous activist Grace Lee Boggs. She's a co-founder and past president of Asian and Pacific Islander America, American Vote Michigan. Representative Chang was raised in Canton, is the daughter of parents who emigrated from Taiwan to pursue greater opportunities. She's a graduate of the University of Michigan which, with a bachelor's degree in psychology and, a, and master's degrees in public policy and in social work. Stephanie and her husband, Sean, live in Detroit and are proud parents of a beautiful young daughter. I have to add this too, I tried to crunch down that bio, that's actually sh the shorter version of it. But I also have to add, just out of all the people I've worked with that are elected officials, I mean, there's just, there's really nobody I've met that has as much passion and like heart and caring for people as Stephanie, you just really get that warm feeling of caring and compassion when you're in the office with her. And I'm not trying to say that there aren't other legislators like that. I just really haven't gotten that as strong as I do from Stephanie Chang. So that's really been an honor working with you. And please give a warm welcome for Stephanie. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much to NASW uh, Michigan for having me here to speak. It's really an honor and just want to give a really special thank you to Alan. Um, some of you may know he's leaving us for California, um, but I'm excited for your next move, although we're, we're sad to see you go. Um, thank you for all of the great work that you do, uh, lifting up social worker issues at the Capitol and uh, for just being a really amazing partner on everything from sexual assault to uh, social worker loan repayment and many, many more issues. So we're going to miss you. Um, I love Lead Day. This is, I think, my third time, third or fourth time here. Um, and I love it because Lead is, I mean, Lead, education and advocacy are right in the name of this conference. And I think that both of those things are just so important to what social workers do. Also, I'm excited that Maria, my friend Maria, is your afternoon keynote. Um, she's an incredible advocate, and I'm really proud to know her through uh, the work that we did to start a fellowship for high school girls in my district called Girls Making Change. So now in my office, um, as state representative, we have had MSW students uh, do their field placement in Detroit and in Lansing, actually, I'm from several universities, including nearby MSU. Any MSU students here? And then we've also had um, a, a number of MSW students from Wayne State. Any Wayne State students here? Okay, very good. And finally, as was mentioned, I got my MSW from the University of Michigan. Um, any other Wolverines here? All right, very good. Um, well, it's really great. And of course, all of the universities, we love you all. Thank you so much for all of you being here. Um, it's, I know that you are all already, um, I love the theme of changing futures. I know that you all are already through your field placements and through the work that you do as social work students are already changing people's lives. Um, so thank you for choosing this profession. It's really something to be proud of. <laughs> 
So as someone who has her MSW and worked as a community organizer before running for the state house, I firmly believe that my skills and experiences as a social worker and an MSW and an activist um, are integral to what I do as a public servant every day. So today I'm hoping to share a little bit with you about my journey to the state house, um, how I try to incorporate social work into what I do and what my team does uh, every single day. And we've got a number of members from my team up here. If you guys want to raise your hands. They've got team, team change shirts on, so um, feel free to chat with them throughout the day. So my journey. Some of you may know a lot of this already, but um, just to share a little bit about you know, my background. Uh, I'm the daughter of immigrants, as was stated earlier. Uh, my parents came to this country looking for better educational opportunity, and they really came here believing that uh, America is a place for opportunity, for access, for justice, for fairness, and those are the same values that I try to fight for uh, every day as a state representative. Um, I grew up in Canton, I went to the public schools there, and um, when I, after I graduated, went to the University of Michigan for undergrad, and that is really where I found my calling as an organizer, uh, working on a number of issues affecting students of color on campus. Um, in my first year there, when I was a freshman, the uh, Supreme Court cases were around affirmative action were actually taking place, and so I remember being a part of students supporting affirmative action and helping organize, um, you know, buses to go to D.C. and and then from there, you know, just four years of a lot of a lot of activism um, and a lot of organizing around a whole host of issues um, affecting students on campus. Um, and so I really think that that was actually a really good training ground for me. Of and so for all of you that are on college campuses, whether you're doing your your graduate work or your undergraduate work, really see this as an incredible opportunity to grow some amazing skills and learn by uh, making mistakes and um, learning from others and um, just trial and error and um, through your field placement, but also through whatever other opportunities you find. After I graduated from the University of Michigan, um, I moved to the city of Detroit. Um, when I was at Michigan, I met Grace Lee Boggs uh, through one of my classes in the Asian Pacific Islander American Studies program. And um, so I actually moved to Detroit. Um, she, I had reconnected th with her through the Detroit Asian Youth Project. And I think she knew that I was hoping to stay in the area. And so she uh, asked me to stay at the Boggs Center. So um, I, for two years, from 2005 to 2007, lived on the east side of Detroit. Um, at the Bog Center, just helping Grace out with a whole lot of different things. Um, and I really think that those first two years in the city of Detroit at the Bog Center um, really helped frame uh, for me um, really what Detroit's history is and what grassroots organizing looks like and activism uh, looks like in the city of Detroit. And so I really credit those first two years um, with a lot. You know, I think that they really informed a lot of who I am today. And some of you may know that Grace passed away in 2015, um, but she, you know, her legacy still absolutely lives on. Um, so after, so I moved to the city of Detroit. My parents were like, what are you doing? Um, and uh, I, right away, you know, I, I actually had a field placement, or a field, a, a, yeah, basically a field placement or lined up um, with a union I was going to do, that would have taken me to Chicago um, to do union organizing with SEIU. Um, I eventually decided not to do that because I knew that um, the anti-affirmative action ballot initiative was likely to come to Michigan and I wanted to be involved in trying to protect affirmative action here in our state. So I decided to stay. Um, so I, for, I I left this opportunity that was like a for sure paid job um, and just started volunteering with this organization that was really trying to educate people about affirmative action, how it's benefited women, how it's benefited people of color, how um, it really has shaped a lot of, uh, how it's really benefited so many communities and shaped uh, so many people. Um, and so I stuck around, uh, moved to the city of Detroit, worked on that campaign, um, worked 
uh, on building coalitions around the state and worked with college students and a whole bunch of other communities to just really organize and try to get people um, informed about what the harms of anti-affirmative action initiatives had been in other states. Um, unfortunately, as you know, we were unsuccessful and so in 2006 that proposal did pass um, and we still definitely see the ramifications of that uh, across our state. Um, but it was a really amazing year and I learned so much um, and after that year, uh, you know, this was during this time where all my friends were leaving the state for other jobs in other states. Um, but I again decided that I wanted to stay in Michigan um, because I, it was really clear to me through that election that we had a lot more work to do um, in terms of equity issues. Um, and so I decided to stay in Michigan again. Um, so I then started working for the ACLU of Michigan, um, really amazing organization. I just, I'm so, I know they're here today, I think, um, and I'm just really so grateful <laughs> for everything that they do. Um, and I had this opportunity to work on indigent defense reform. So basically what this was, was a really incredible coalition effort that we built um, to try to make sure that people who are accused of a crime, can't afford a lawyer, that they get adequate legal representation um, for a whole host of reasons. But it um, was really an eye-opening experience where I learned so much about what works and unfortunately what doesn't work in our criminal justice system. And again, built a bipartisan coalition of groups that normally do not work together um, and from both sides of the political spectrum um, to get really good starting legislation towards reform of, of making sure that we have a, a criminal justice system that works. So really proud of that effort. I did that for about five years. And while I was doing that, I also helped start, um, as was mentioned, Asian Pacific Islander American Vote Michigan, which does, till, still to this day, does really great work mobilizing, registering, and educating Asian American voters uh, across the state of Michigan and also was very active on uh, advocating for uh, comprehensive immigration reform, immigrants' rights issues here at the state level, as well as voting rights and, and redistricting issues. So, um, so just basically, you know, I had worked on a whole bunch of issues as a social justice organizer, um, wasn't thinking about running for office, it just wasn't on the radar. Um, but while I was working for the Campaign for Justice on this indigent defense effort and also doing API vote, I decided to go back to grad school. So went to the University of Michigan to get my master's in social work and master's in public policy. Love that dual degree, by the way. It's a really nice combination for those of you who are interested in uh, both policy and organizing. Um, I really loved that dual degree. Um, and it was a really nice, I think it really actually fits very well with the work that I currently do. Um, and I really, I mean, I, I had been learning so much through experience, but I wanted to get back to school, be in an academic setting, you know, learn theory, um, be around other people and learn from them who um, shared my values, and then also become a better researcher and a writer and also um, increase my quantitative analysis skills. So while I was in grad school, another sort of like change in direction and twist of events, um, my good friend Rashida Talib and a number of other friends um, started to encourage me to consider running uh, for the state house. So some of you probably know in Michigan, we have term limits. So in the state house, you can only do six years. So I helped Rashida on each of her three campaigns for the state house. And um, in her last reelection to the state house, um, she, uh, started to try to, I didn't realize this at the time, but she was trying to get me to start thinking about running for office. Um, and then in, in the beginning of 2013, she actually said, you know, you should run to replace me in the state house. Um, I'm pretty sure the first two or three times she said that, I just kind of laughed it off, didn't take it seriously. Um, but then eventually we actually, she was like, we have to have a serious conversation about your future. So we sat down and talked about it. And um, I know that for a lot of you, you may or may not be thinking about what your 
what your role is in politics, um, about whether running for office is something that's an appropriate thing for you to do. And um, for me, I had a lot of the same questions that I would imagine you might have in thinking about, am I prepared enough? Do I know about enough about all of the issues? Um, am, I, am I too young? Do I have enough experience? Um, and uh, so I just grappled with a lot of these questions that, I'll be honest, I think a lot more women think about these questions than men uh, when being approached for running for office. Um, and so it took me six months. It was really uh, just this really strange process of trying to decide whether or not to run. Um, and luckily I had some great friends and mentors uh, who were around me to really encourage me and to answer my really random questions about all sorts of things. Um, and then I also shadowed uh, Rashida at the state capitol and to really, I'm a visual person, so I kind of needed to just see what it felt like and what it looked like um, to, to serve and what it looked like at the capitol. Um, and so eventually I decided to run. Um, it was a really, great experience. Um, running for office is unlike anything else. It um, is, you have to, you learn a lot about yourself, you learn a lot about your community. And um, so in 2014, I won uh, my Democratic primary after about a year of campaigning, raising money while still in grad school, actually started door knocking while I was also still in grad school and working part time. So it was a little bit crazy. I would not suggest running for office while you're in grad school. Um, but uh, somehow we made it work um, with a really great team um, that, uh, that really reflected me, I think, in being both young and people of color and progressive. Uh, we, we won with about 50% of the vote in a seven way primary. Um, with about a 17 percentage margin. So I did really well, um, obviously with the support of Rashida, but also with a lot, a lot, a lot of hard work on the campaign trail. Um, and so I became the first Asian American woman elected to the state legislature. And, <laughs> and so it's been, that was a journey in itself that whole year of my first campaign. Um, definitely learned a lot um, through that first campaign and uh, you, you know, Alan Manson mentioned my passion. I, I am very passionate. Um, I also am, can get sort of emotional about things that I care about. Um, and then through the campaign, you also, uh, you get a little bit of a thicker skin just to, through the whole process. Um, so, and then even thicker skin through the process of being a legislator. Um, so. So that's sort of my journey from, okay, up until running for, for office and then getting elected the first time in 2014. I'll tell you, it's been a whirlwind since 2014, and um, I'm really proud of the work that we've been able to do. Um, so, you know, I think that we titled this um, keynote, Getting Things Done Through Legislation, Social Activism, and Community Partnerships. So I do want to talk about how I incorporate social work into the work that my team and I uh, do both in the district and at the Capitol. So community partnerships are really key. And one of the core values of social workers, as you all know, um, for the code of ethics is service. Um, service is in every single thing that we do. And in my district, I've continued the tradition of my predecessors, Rashida Tlaib and Steve Tabachman, in running a neighborhood service center where we're open Monday through Friday, uh, we're, a place where people can come and get help um, and we serve residents directly every single day and actually share that office with another political social worker, uh, Detroit Council Member Raquel Castaneda Lopez. So we call ourselves the Mary Turner Center for Advocacy and through our office we have a lot of partnerships. Um, we help hundreds of families every year um, in our partnership with Wayne Metropolitan Community Action Agency. We help residents with water shutoffs and utility shutoffs uh, through our partnership with the Wayne County Treasurer. Uh, we resolve tax foreclosure issues with our partnership with the International Institute. We do a Become a Citizen's Day every year or sometimes twice a year to help people become citizens. And the, immigration, the International Institute is actually in our office every single month, um, providing really critical immigration services for free or low 
low cost uh, to residents in and around our district. Uh, we also partner a lot with the United Community Housing Coalition, which is just another amazing organization. Um, and they work with us a lot on tenant issues as well as tax foreclosure. And right now, some of you might know about a recent situation in the city of Detroit um, with a Park, Park Avenue hotel. It's about a 180 unit um, building where the residents are uh, on October 5th all got eviction notices um, and there's a developer that's coming in to turn it into a hotel and so we're trying to help uh, both work with the mayor's office as well as United Community Housing Coalition to make sure that every single one of those families gets taken care of um, and that they find a place to stay um, and so as social workers, uh, we're on the ground, we're doing the work, we're helping residents, but I think it's also really important that we're not just helping residents every day, um, but we're also connecting them with the larger picture and thinking about advocacy. So I gave all those examples, right, of all of the partnerships that we do, some of the partnerships we do, um, but I wanna point this out. So while we have Wayne Metro in our office and we're helping people get water back on, at the same time while we're providing that direct service, I'm also pushing at the state capitol our legislation around water shutoff protections and around water affordability plans. And so it's important to make those connections. And while at the same time we're helping people save their homes from tax foreclosure, helping get them connected with payment plans, we're also introducing legislation around tax foreclosure about how we can resolve this issue and, how, and around a whole number of other housing justice uh, issues, which I think are going to continue to be a big problem um, in the city of Detroit. We also partner a lot with the Michigan Immigrants Rights Center, with Michigan United and many others, um, especially in this current um, uh, administration. We've done a lot of Know Your Rights seminars around uh, immigrants' rights, and uh, we also have sent I don't even know how many letters uh, to Rebecca Aducci, who's the director of the ICE office in the city of Detroit, um, really just trying to urge her to see the humanity of individuals who are facing deportation. Many of these people, as you probably know, um, have no criminal background whatsoever, um, sometimes maybe just a traffic ticket or nothing. And um, so we try to advocate as best we can while also being a voice and trying to advocate uh, for humane and comprehensive uh, reform. A few other programs we've run out of our neighborhood service center I want to provide. And part of the reason why I'm sharing all of this is because I think sometimes people think of legislators or policymakers or see us on TV as, you know, talking about policies that we're um, introducing at the Capitol or really contentious issues at the, um, you know, at the federal or state level that we're voting yes or no on. Um, but we really do so much more than that, um, or at least we try to, um, and, in, and we really try to be outside of the box a little bit. So I would encourage you to stay in touch with your legislators and make sure that they're doing as much as they possibly can because it's about public service. Um, but the Girls Making Change Fellowship I mentioned earlier I love that program so much. Um, when I first ran for office, um, I said to myself, it took me six months to decide to run for office. Um, and it, uh, part of the reason why I was able to make that decision was because of the mentorship of other women of color. And I realized that it shouldn't be that hard for us to make that leap. Um, and so I want to help build the pipeline for other young girls of color, or other women of color, um, to one day see that they could run for office. And so um, starting the Girls Making Change Fellowship was something I promised at my very first kickoff in 2014 um, when I launched my campaign. And so in 2016, we cobbled together some grants to be able to make it happen. And so this is a fellowship program of about 10 girls each year where they learn leadership skills, how to organize, um, they develop a community action plan um, and the, a project, and they have worked so far on a number of issues, everything from sexual assault um, to, uh, to food justice, and it's just such an incredible program, and I love that it's actually been MSW students who have run this program every year, Mary and Maria the first year uh, from U of M, and then Gabby uh, Santiago Romero, also from Michigan, who have run it, who has run it this past year and then the year before. Um, the community baby shower was mentioned in my bio and I love the community baby shower. Um, so as was mentioned, I'm a mom of a young daughter um, and I realize, you know, I have, I have privilege in that I have a lot of resources to be able to 
to and a lot of family in the area um, and to be able to provide for my child um, in the way that I that I want to and that I am able to. Um, and I recognize that in my district there's a lot of moms um, who may not have those resources. So we put together now we've done it twice, a community baby shower, where it's not just giving away gifts and the food, which is fun and is really good, um, and we do cake and everything, um, but we also bring in people to do workshops on breastfeeding and infant CPR and safe sleep um, and things like that. And we did a car seat um, installation uh, thing the first year as well. Um, and so I love that event. I'm hoping we can continue it um, because I think it's a really critical service that we can provide. And as a mom and as a social worker, it's something that I thought was really key for our district. So social workers and political issues, right? We're in 2016, we're five days away from the election. Um, as I think probably you may be feeling, it's I think both a scary time and a hopeful time in our country. We see so many issues every single day uh, that serve as a reminder about why social workers can and why we must speak out. Whether it's families being separated, not just at the border, um, but also on a regular basis in Detroit and communities across our country, or whether it's clean air and water under attack on a regular basis, or the senseless gun violence that continue to impact our schools, our public spaces, our neighborhoods, or the hate crimes that have increased in numbers since the 2016 election. As social workers who work hand in hand with residents on the front lines, or who are organizing and mobilizing groups of individuals, it's our duty to tell those stories of the families that we work for and the families that we work with when the father is deported to say that, you know, he's leaving behind children who are traumatized and who suffer long-term psychological harm. It's our responsibility to talk about how gun violence is a public health issue, how it's a social worker issue, and how some incidents could actually be prevented if we enacted common sense gun violence prevention policies like red flag legislation. And it's also our job to talk about how the individuals that you might see at a clinic that you work in for one issue might also be suffering from asthma or stress um, from living in an area surrounded by industrial pollution or might see border patrol agents every day in their neighborhood. Social workers and politics, I think, is really a good and important mix. Uh, so continue to get politically involved and, in, and be involved in the policy arena as well. Um, I really do think that social workers need to run for office. Uh, I never, I keep saying that every group of social workers that I am able to talk to, I say that, um, but I never really believed it more than I believe that this year. I'm the, currently I'm the only uh, social worker in the Michigan legislature. Uh, hopefully we can change that um, because I really think it's to the detriment of families across our state that I'm the only one with that MSW degree. I wanna share just two examples of policy issues that I've worked on that I think really speak to social work, values of social justice, uh, dignity, and worth of the person. So I mentioned gun violence before, and I think that this is probably on many of our minds uh, given recent events in Pittsburgh and honestly every day um, around the country, sometimes in our own communities. Uh, earlier this year, I worked with two Republican women uh, to introduce a bipartisan three-bill package related to domestic violence and firearms. Um, as many of you know, one in four women and one in seven men have been the victim of severe physical violence by an intimate partner, partner in their lifetime. And more than half of women murdered with guns in this country are killed by intimate partners. House Bills 6134 to 36, our bills, would, keep, would help to keep firearms out of the hands of people very likely to be a danger. Individuals with a second or subsequent conviction of misdemeanor domestic violence would be prohibited from having a gun for three years after the completion of their sentence. Currently, as you might know, um, under the current felony in possession statute, if you have a felony, depending on what felony it is, you can't have a gun for three to five years. And so this bills, this set of bills is just adding misdemeanor domestic violence uh, to that list. Research shows that the presence of a gun in domestic violence situations increases the risk of homicide. We also know that domestic violence escalates. The first time, it might be a misdemeanor or it might be something um, that's somewhat minor, but the next time it might be more serious, and then the next time after that it might be even more serious. So having a gun in that situation uh, really can make things much more deadly. Research actually shows, um, there's an MSU professor um, who's done a lot of research on this topic, 
and, it, and her research shows that when we actually put in place restrictions to prevent convicted abusers from accessing deadly weapons, the number of intimate partner murders drops between 7 to 19%. Many of you in this room might know someone or be someone or have worked with someone at your field placement who's a survivor of domestic violence. You know the trauma, you know the danger, and you know that often it might take more than one instance for that person to decide to leave the situation. You also know, through your work as social workers, that if the abuser has a gun, things can be that much more deadly. We can prevent some of these domestic violence homicides, and our proposals are a really reasonable compromise. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about the legislative process, I actually worked on this for about two years before even introducing the bills. I worked with the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office very closely, and also a colleague, a close colleague of mine on the Republican side, um, to really try to refine the bills to a place where I thought that we could get this done in a Republican-controlled legislature. Uh, while still keeping true to the original intention of the bills. We actually did change the bill quite a bit, um, all the while actually knowing that Kansas, a redder state, um, actually passed legislation that's a little bit stronger than what we've introduced. Uh, we did have a committee hearing on these bills about a month ago, um, and I'm going to keep pushing for them, um, but in any changes about in any conversations about potentially changing them, I'm gonna always keep in mind our social worker values um, because I think that this is too important of an issue um, to make further compromise where it doesn't keep to the intention of the bill. Another issue I do wanna talk about briefly is housing. When I came into the legislature, I don't think I knew anything about housing issues, um, but I have quickly learned quite a bit because it is a top priority for a lot of the residents in our district, and it's on the minds of a lot of people, um, especially vulnerable seniors um, in our neighborhoods. Um, my, my district, if some of you might know the, the geography of it, um, it's home to some of the poorest neighborhoods in Detroit and also some of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Detroit as well. Um, but things are really changing only in some areas. Um, a few years ago, seniors who come to our senior advisory council that we put together, usually on a bi-monthly or quarterly basis, they were talking about how they were afraid that they were going to be displaced. Um, because rents were going up or in some of these cases the seniors lived in a building that had a HUD subsidy and they knew that their the HUD subsidy was going to run out at some point and that maybe the apartment building was going to go to market rate and then they wouldn't have anywhere to live. So they're feeling this fear. We also heard from homeowners who are also seniors who uh, were really worried about seeing you know all this development happening around them and wondering if property values are gonna go up and what that's gonna mean for them. You often hear of rising property values as a good thing, and in some cases it might be a good thing, but we know as social workers that when you have a senior citizen who's on a fixed income, has been in her home for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, rising property values might not be a good thing for that vulnerable resident. So that's why I introduced House Bill 6250, which would freeze the taxable value of a home for senior residents who have been in their home for 10 or more years and whose income is $40,000 or below. I worked on this legislation with friends at a, a really amazing organization um, called Senior Housing Preservation Detroit, SHPTE. And some of you might know that they actually helped uh, a number of seniors when they were displaced from what's now uh, the Albert downtown. It's, it's a high-rise apartment building. As things continue to change, especially in cities like Detroit, and as development happens in some of the cities that have struggled over the past few decades, it's really, really critical that we keep in mind our vulnerable residents. First and foremost, our longtime senior residents. They stuck it out through many, many challenging times, and I believe that they shouldn't have to leave their homes because of changes that are totally out of their control. We know that displacement, as social workers we know, that displacement is not just about losing a house, it's about losing a home, a place with memories. It's also about psychological stress and physical health that can suffer due to such dramatic change. Shipti actually developed a really amazing assessment tool um, that would uh, help seniors facing displacement. And so I've also introduced legislation that would mirror what they have and ask Mishta to create and disseminate a similar assessment tool. So I've introduced at this point several bills related to housing justice in the past year and a half. Um, and I'm gonna continue to make this a priority because I'm very, very concerned. And I wanna make sure that we prevent displacement and other tragedies from happening. 
So as I wrap things up, let me just say again that I'm very proud to be a social worker and I'm really honored to be with you today, my fellow social workers and change makers. And I probably don't need to remind any of you that we do have an election in five days on November 6th. But I am gonna remind you that I know that you've probably heard this before, but I really, really believe this and I know a number of people who have been around for decades believe this as well. This may be the most important election of our lifetime. So if you're worried about what's happening in our country, or concerned about what the future may hold for my daughter's generation or your son's generation, or if you have clients who are affected by the harmful policies coming out of Lansing or Washington, vote on Tuesday. Uh, but do more than that. Please knock on doors, donate money, make phone calls. I feel it looks like you're going to be making some phone calls later on today. And even an hour helping a candidate that you believe in or volunteering for an organization, whether nonpartisan or partisan, really does make a huge difference, especially in these last five days. So today at LEAD Day, I hope you gain new knowledge about critical issues and leave with new skills and connections that help you on your journey as a social worker. Thank you for choosing this profession. You are leaders in public service. Um, and please always remember that in the easiest times and in the most difficult times, it's our duty to speak up, to vote, and to take action. Thank you so much. So we have a few minutes left. Uh, does is there anybody that has a couple questions for Stephanie? Can you can you shout? I don't have a microphone for you. Whose whose income has reduced and their credit scores have gone down now cannot afford home and auto insurance because of insurance credit scoring. And different commercials on TV have different sayings. I don't know who is uh, associated with the bill, but is anything being done to help push this bill so that we can have an equitable way of calculating credit scores? Sure, okay, so um, if it so the question was around seniors in particular, credit scores, how that influences auto insurance. So, okay, so we could probably talk about auto insurance for an hour, um, but I won't. So what I'll say is that currently uh, we have one of the most unregulated car insurance uh, rate setting mechanisms in the country. Um, and so right now car insurance companies can use your credit score to determine your rate. They can also use if you're a widow, if you have a military service background, your zip code, your educational attainment, your gender, all of these things. And we all know that actually, probably the most important things that should determine your car insurance rate is your driving record, maybe how long you've had that car, any information about that car, not necessarily any of these factors that sometimes are out of your control. So credit scores, um, we actually, I have a bill and a number of others have bills related to this that would actually remove credit scores from being considered um, by car insurance companies. In California, what they do, and here's the thing, we can learn from other states. Other states um, have policies that uh, work better. Um, and in this, in this case, but we also need to keep what works here in Michigan. Um, so, but in California, what they do, they do a lot of things that are different in California, obviously, but one of the things that they do with auto insurance is that it's there's three mandatory factors that a car insurance company has to use. Your driving record, the number of miles on your car, and your years of driving experience. And then anything after that has to be weighted less than those three mandatory factors. Uh, they cannot use credit score and they can't use gender. Um, and so I actually have a bill that basically mirrors what that, uh, what that happens the way that works in California. Um, and several of my colleagues, Sherry Gay Danyogo and Abdullah Hamoud, have bills that would just completely get rid of the use of zip codes or any non-driving factors, which I actually support those proposals as well. I just wanted to throw out another idea into the mix as a sort of a compromise. Um, but I agree, you know, I don't think that your credit score should determine your car insurance rate. It has no place in that. Um, and so, I'm hoping that in a new legislature that looks hopefully much more balanced um, than the one that we have right now and hopefully, and you know, a governor um, who will come with a different set of priorities and values um, that will be able to 
try to advance um, some meaningful reform that protects vulnerable residents and um, addresses those issues. So thanks for raising that. It's a really big priority for, for me and a number of others. Other, maybe one more question. Being the only social worker on legislation, would you feel a little intimidated at times or, you know, less, you know, because you're a minority? Um, so serving in the legislature is, is a kind of a weird thing. Um, we, I, I love it. I love this job so much, despite all of the craziness and the drama that does exist in the politics and, um, I, I love this job. I've never really felt marginalized as a social worker. Um, I do think that I, my colleagues know that I'm very passionate. Um, I have probably like one out of only a couple of people who have openly cried on the House floor about like bills that I just thought were completely unjust um, and were gonna do harm to my community. And so I, I am like very uh, passionate and, and my colleagues know that, but they also at the same time, I think that, I, mean, I think this is fair to say, I, I have built um, a lot of um, strong relationships and a track record where um, folks on both sides of the aisle generally, I think, respect me and uh, respect my leadership. And so, uh, because they know how hard I work and they know how much I care about my residents and also because I'm able to work across the aisle to get things done. And so while maybe there was any initial uh, either pushback or feelings that maybe I was somehow different because either I'm a social worker or because I'm a woman or because I'm Asian American or because I'm young or because I'm from Detroit, you know, any of those things, um, I think that those can be overcome through working extremely hard um, and then also just building relationships with my colleagues um, to the point where I think that I think that I, I've gained a reputation as one of the hardest working legislators in Lansing and someone who is generally respected on both sides of the aisle. So I'm, I, it takes work to be able to build that type of reputation, but um, you know, I'm hoping that that will continue to serve me well, hopefully in, four, in my next four to eight years. So, Okay, last question over there. Okay, um, if you heard of the Violence Against Women's Act of 2018 reauthorization at the federal, federal level, if it doesn't pass, would you support one at the state level? So I think the question was around VAWA and reauthorization at the federal level. And uh, if it doesn't get reauthorized, what could happen at the state level? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think that obviously it's important that we actually pass it at the federal level. And so I think that's where the Emphasis should continue to be for now, um, but at the state level, I think there's obviously things that we can do. Um, I, as far as specific legislation or specific um, policy proposals, I have not had those conversations yet, um, but I have a really strong uh, working relationship given some of the issues that I've worked on uh, with the Michigan Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. So thank you for your question. I will get in touch with them and would love to hear your thoughts as well about what, if anything, we need to do at the state level to safeguard um, our rights if, if, uh, if it is not reauthorized at the federal level. Thank you for that question. Really important topic. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Chang. Can you, everybody, please give her a huge round of applause. 